Hello, welcome to the last session, or the, or the last presentation of this session. Um, this is Chris Beaumont from Harvard University and the University of Hawaii presenting on multidimensional data exploration with glue, which is really cool. So, all right, is this uh, good for the audio and video? We're okay. Okay. Um, let me start my timer. Okay, uh, so my name is Chris Beaumont. Thanks for having me. I am a graduate student at Harvard and the University of Hawaii. And um, I'm going to be talking about Glue, which is a project I've been working on with Tom Robitaille, Alyssa Goodman, and Michelle Borkin. And the purpose of Glue is to make it easier to visually explore related data sets. And so um, my goal for the talk is to first just make the general argument that I think we need better tools for exploration of related data sets, and then talk about some of the specific ways that Glue's tried to tackle this problem. Uh, so my Twitter handle is at Beaumont Chris, if you want to tweet at me. Um, the most important thing to know is that there is this project called Glue. It has a website, gluevis.org. Um, you should take a look, watch some of the movies, let me know what you think, tell your friends. Um, and to, to set up, I think, where Glue sits, um, I wanted to think about the ways in which data sets are changing and the ways in which data sets are changing how we do science. Um, so we all know that data sets are growing, um, but they're growing in two distinct directions, and I think it's important to recognize that these directions are different. Yeah, is there a question? No. Oh. No, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so the data sets are growing in two directions. The, the direction I think we all know about is that data sets are growing larger, and so we have this trendy term of big data to describe that. I'm not gonna dwell a lot on big data in this talk, um, other than to say that I think primarily the challenges with big data are mainly engineering problems, meaning that the largest data sets that we have access to now are so large that simply storing them and running computation on them becomes non-trivial. And so we need to come up with good kind of engineering solutions to those problems if we want to fully take advantage of those kinds of data sets. Um, data is also growing in a different direction, though, and I would say that data sets are growing out. Uh, this doesn't have a trendy buzz term, so I'd like to propose wide data. Um, and by wide data, I mean that as data sets become more pervasive, they also become more interconnected to each other or more interrelated. Uh, so I come from astronomy. It's very rare for an astronomer to write a paper that's on a single observation. Much more likely nowadays is that somebody will collect data and they will compare that observation to other observations of that object at different times or wavelengths, or they'll compare that to other observations of similar objects at other points in the sky, or they'll compare them to simulated data sets to try and tease out um, what's going on and comparing things to theory. And really, um, I think the, the problem with wide data is fundamentally a human problem and not an engineering problem, by which I mean, um, I think the bottleneck for discovery with why data is the problem of humans trying to understand and tease out all the different kind of relationships that exist potentially in high dimensions and across many different files and being able to kind of synthesize all of that complementary information into new insight about the world. Um, and so I think we need tools that make why data more tractable. I think part of the reason why we need better tools is that a lot of our really good tools uh, that we, we currently use, I think, are oriented towards single data sets at a time. I think this is definitely true in astronomy. Um, so uh, we have a lot of good tools in astronomy for image viewing and for catalog browsing. Um, but once you start talking about several data sets at a time, they become much more cumbersome. And so you either have to just look at one data set at a time with these tools and then kind of manually kind of form ideas about the relationships afterwards, or you have to do something like data cleaning where you take all of your you know, diverse data sets, and then you munge them into some mega data set. You could think of like a huge data frame, right? And then feed that thing into an exploration tool. And I've seen a lot of people do this. Um, there's a lot of problems with it. I mean, at a minimum, it's tricky to do. There's a lot of effort in, in terms of like registering and aligning and merging data sets. And a lot of times it's not even possible at all. You can't do that without throwing away information, without smoothing over a data set. And so really, I think it would be better if our exploration tools, I think, respected kind of the nature of our data sets, and that is, data sets spread across many files. So that's kind of the problem that Glue is trying to solve. And I think we have four main kind of um, interface aspects that, that we use to tackle this problem. And I'll, I'll go into each of these. But those basic ideas are, are obviously multiple data set support. The idea of being able to have multiple complementary views into each data set. Um, I'll describe what that means in a second. Um, making all those different views kind of connected to each other with this notion of brushing and linking, and then integrating with Python as much as possible so that you can combine kind of very flexible GUI type interaction with more precise code-based, code-driven data exploration. So I'm going to attempt a live demo, which might be the downfall of me. 
Um, but if this fails, I have backup movies. So this is the basic Glue interface. I've loaded two data sets, but I haven't done anything else yet, really. Um, and so at its most basic level, Glue is a, basically a GUI that sits on top of Matplotlib that makes it easier to interactively generate the kind of vanilla Matplotlib plots, like scatter plots, images, and histograms. So I've loaded two data sets. One's an image, one's a catalog. These are both of a star-forming region. And so after I load data sets in Glue, I can take something and drag it over into this visualization area. Glue asks me how I want to visualize the data set. My choices right now are image, scatter plot, histogram. I'll choose the default image. And I just get a normal Matplotlib image here. Um, there's a little bit of extra uh, interactivity. For example, I could adjust the contrast if I want to. So we add some kind of tools to, to make working with the data a little bit easier. Um, but importantly in Glue, you can make multiple representations of each data set. So I could drag the image over into the visualization area again and select something different, say like a histogram of the distribution of pixel intensity values, um, and get a second plot. And the defaults here are pretty bad, so I'll change something to like 700 bins maybe. Um, or a maximum of 700 and maybe a logarithmic access. So now I have two representations of the data set. One's kind of more of a statistical view, one's more giving me a sense of the spatial relationship of, of pixels. Um, and importantly, these two things aren't isolated plots, but everything is linked together with this idea of brushing and linking, by which I mean, in any of these plots, you can isolate regions of interest, kind of interesting regions of parameter space, and see that region rendered in all the different views. So I could say I'm you know, interested in this intermediate range of pixel values, highlight that range, let go, and those pixels are then rendered in pink on the histogram, which is a little bit hard to see on top of the black. Um, but then also you see these um, pinkish pixels on the image. And these things stay linked so that if I want to go back to the image and say, actually, I care more about you know, this right half of the cloud, I could select that and update the histogram as well. I could independently normalize the histogram so you can see the red on top of the black. Um, and you can do a lot of things like you know, combine these selections using Boolean logic to drill down into the pieces of data that you care about the most. Um, and so if you've ever used this before, you probably know that it's a very nice way of um, thinking about high dimensional data because you can make a lot of lower dimensional visualizations and start picking out corners of parameter space and then seeing them in different projections. Um, so this is all still one data set and Glue tries to generalize this idea to multiple related data sets. So let me make a visualization of the catalog. This is now um, a bunch of properties of young stars in the same region. This is W5 for the astronomers. Um, and so I'll make a scatter plot. I can choose basically which columns in the catalog I assign to each axis. I'm gonna make a color color diagram. The astrophysics of this aren't super important other than to say that in diagrams like this, this, like this upper corner of the plot is a little astrophysically interesting. These really red sources are usually young regions of, oh, sorry, excuse me, um, young kind of like star forming uh, sources that are deeply embedded. So let me just delete this subset for now, um, pick a new region, which is these red sources that I care about. And what I'd really like to be able to do is compare those interesting sources to um, the image and somehow kind of like more explicitly compare those um, together. And so I'll just kind of show the magic way and then explain how it works. But basically after Glue is set up and the data set is loaded and configured, I can just uh, take this subset, drag it on top of the image, and those points are plotted in the correct location on the sky. And everything is still linked. So then if I said, actually, you know, I again want to zoom in on this particular part of the cloud, I can select a gazillion points. And if I zoom in, I see there's actually just a big cloud of points here. Um, so the question is, how does this work in Glue? Um, and the step I didn't show you is basically after you load data sets, Glue doesn't assume anything magical about your data, but you're allowed to specify the logical connections that exist in your data. And so if you click this link data dialog, you get this list that's basically all the data sets that you've opened and then all of the quantities attached to each data set. And so in this case, there's this pretty simple relationship between the catalog and the image. There's a column in the catalog that's the right ascension, that's the X coordinate on the sky, it's a spatial coordinate quantity. And there's uh, a right ascension column or a piece of information in the image as well, parsed from the header. And so I can just highlight both of these things, tell Glue to glue these columns together, and then Glue now understands that those things are describing the same piece of information. Likewise, I could go to the declination, which is the Y coordinate on the sky, glue those things together, um, and then once that's done, Glue basically understands enough. You should at least probably understand on some level that there's enough information for it to figure out where in the image each point should go. So that's the basic kind of idea behind Glue. Um, the, ex the example I showed was uh, fairly straightforward in that the linking looked like this. Basically there was a quantity in each data set that was the same quantity in the same units. And in general, you don't have that kind of nice relationship between data. So the way that we've generalized that in Glue is the idea of having functional relationships between different quantities and different data sets. So in general, you may not have one-to-one -one relationships, but you have something like this, where you have a quantity W in data set two 
that's functionally related to A, meaning that if you took the quantity A and you passed it through a translation function called A to W, then the quantity that you get out of that function is W. And so in Glue, you can actually specify these functions when you're linking together data and say, actually, you know, these how, are how these things are related. And basically, anything that you can express as a Python function, you can actually write yourself um, and inform Glue about, and Glue will use those things. So behind the scenes, Glue basically knows about what quantities are being plotted on each axis, and it maintains this network of all the relationships that you've defined about the data sets. And when it comes time to kind of explicitly intercompare two different data files, like for example, to overplot a scatter plot on an image, or to use a selection in an image to filter the rows in a catalog, it goes through and tries to figure out a path from the quantities that are natively present in the data set to the quantities it needs to make that comparison. And it will find that path that exists and call the right set of transformation functions for you. So you basically just kind of specify the high level logic and let Glue deal with all the issues of kind of like data munging and transformation for you. So just to show you that this is fairly flexible, um, here's another example where the relationship between the data sets isn't spatial at all. So this is a, a research project I was doing. The data set on the right is a star forming region. Uh, the image on the left is a simulation of a, a cloud that's supposed to be um, similar in nature to the image on the right. And so there's no spa these things don't overlap on the sky. There's no spatial connection between them. But they do define a common set of quantities. Like there is a notion of temperature in both of these data sets. And there's a notion of the intensity at each point in the sky and the mass to light ratio and things like that. And so we can link all of those things together instead of the spatial coordinates. So the histogram on the bottom is showing the distribution of the mass to light ratio at each location for both data sets. And then you can do things, of course, like highlight a particular range of that statistical space and see what pixels correspond to both data sets there. And you can see those highlighted in pink. Um, so this was really useful in what we were doing. We were basically able to look at a bunch of these different statistical distributions, um, find ones where the observations and simulations were discrepant from each other, and then highlight that region of discrepancy to see where spatially the observations were diverging from the simulations. And we were able to see that in most cases of the discrepancy, they were um, in regions of gas that were affected by stellar feedback. And that was something that wasn't in the simulation, and we could kind of pinpoint what was causing the simulation not to capture the observed properties of the data set. So one of the other really nice things about Python or Glue is the fact that it's written in Python. And Python is great because it has a lot of good tools for data analysis. And a lot of scientists prefer Python as their kind of language of choice for, for doing data exploration and data analysis. So we knew that we wanted to integrate Glue with Python as much as possible and make it as easy as possible for people who know Python to be able to leverage that knowledge when they're using Glue. And so one of the nice things we have is this utility function called QGlue, which will just take as inputs um, normal kind of data variables in Python. They could be data frames or dictionaries of data or AstroPy table objects. And it will just turn those into Glue objects and drop you into the Glue GUI. Um, so just to see an example of that, let me show you this. So this is just a, a notebook I was playing around with. This is a bunch of data that the city of Boston publishes about the locations of buses. And so this is kind of like a, as a function of time, or as a function of distance traveled for a particular bus, how much time has elapsed. It's not super important. Um, but you know, there's messy data and things like this, and so these outliers, it's not clear what's causing these things. This is just in a pandas data frame with 10 dimensions. And so you can just pass this data frame to QGlue, and if I run this, it just drops right into the Glue UI, and I have this new data set here called Bus01. And so I can just start dragging things over and make interactive scatter plots to start you know, isolating some of these outliers to try and get a better sense of what's going on. So I could say, like, you know, here's some weird points, and then I can make a second scatter plot to look at a different set of quantities. Um, so hopefully you can kind of see this is a nice way of kind of bouncing back and forth between a traditional kind of like more statically driven um, IPython notebook style workflow and then something that's a little bit more interactive and GUI driven. Um, so that integration also goes the other way, meaning that f within Glue, we also give you access to an IPython terminal. That's what this window is down here. And you can actually drag data sets from this little window of, of data in the upper left down into that terminal and assign them to Python variables and then use them from the command line. Um, so this is just uh, playing around with a famous data set of an outbreak of cholera in London in um, 1854, I think. The story behind this was that within a week, like 100 people in London died of cholera. Nobody really knew how cholera was spread. And this physician, Jon Snow, different from the Game of Thrones, Jon Snow, figured out that it had to do with people's drinking water supply. And so all the stars here are locations of water pumps. All the colored dots are locations of people who died. And he realized that all of these deaths were clustered around a single water pump. And that was kind of how people eventually learned to understand how cholera spread. 
Um, and so what I did here is I kind of just took that pump data set and the death data set onto the command line. I was looking at just the raw numbers array, and eventually I imported like a nearest neighbor function and said, all right, well, you know, show me all of the rows in the death data set that are closest to the suspicious pump, and then I sent that back to Glue and say, plot those as kind of these big magenta circles. So all that kind of thick blob of magenta, those are all the deaths that basically those people live closer to the pump that turned out to be contaminated with sewage than any other pump in the city. So that's basically what I wanted to say, and I want to leave time for some questions. Um, so I'll just kind of reiterate that I think um, it's important to think about the structure of our data sets. And I think you know Python is a very flexible language, and I think it's one of the things we like about the language. And I think we should be thinking about how to leverage that flexibility to kind of match the flexibility of our data sets. And um, we have the opportunity to build potentially very flexible kind of GUI exploration tools that um, kind of combine the best aspects of GUIs, but also um, Python itself to kind of better uh, think about relationships among our data sets. So um, I'll stop there. Thanks. That's right. So in general, you, I mean, you can define one-way functions, um, and it's just, in general, if glue depends on the, the reverse direction, it won't know what function to call, and it won't do that for you. But you can specify functions going in both directions. To, to. And then the other question I have was, I mean, it seems like an exploratory tool. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there anything to sort of capture that workflow? I've got an analysis that I like. Yeah. Yeah, so we have some functionality there, and it's something that I'd like to develop more. So the things that we have so far, um, you can save your entire session as this kind of like huge pickle file and then reopen the state to get back to the same data sets, and that will save the links. Um, when you've defined subsets, you can save them out to files as like masks so that you could, you know, I, that's what I use this most for, the, the I.O. part is, you know, I'll save out the mask and then I'll do some more rigorous analysis in a scripted environment. What I'd really like to be able to do long term, though, is basically export the state of glue to some kind of script that reproduces everything that you did. And that requires effort that I haven't put into it yet, but that's a great place to go. Yeah. Sure. Um, so we support three dimensional images by just having a slider on the image so that you can pick which slice you're looking at. Um, yeah, you can pick, well, you can't flip the axes, but you can choose which axis you're sliding over. Yeah, so we use that a lot for um, observational radio data cubes. Um, and then beyond that, if you have catalog data, you can obviously choose which two quantities you plot. And then we have some demo code that's not in main glue yet that used um, VTK to do some like um, actual like volume rendering. Yeah. What's the uh, support for things like the metadata? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the metadata that's global for like a bunch of variables that you're Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so this is one of the things that we realized too that I think a traditional, oh sorry, I'm supposed to be repeating the question. The question is how much support do you have for file metadata? How aware is Glue of things like metadata? Um, and so a traditional pain point with a lot of these GUIs is they're constantly falling over when you try to load, like you know, somebody sends you a file that they made on their computer and it doesn't load correctly. Um, so. One of the things that we realized is it would be better to allow people to write their own functions to handle kind of really customized file loading. So that's one option we give you. It's fairly easy. Any, basically anything that takes this input, a string, like a path, and returns a glue data object, you can basically attach to the glue UI. And so that accommodates some of the metadata stuff. Um, but then when you get to like more subtle things, we don't do a lot with the metadata other than basically conversion between you know, like pixel coordinates and world coordinates. Um, other than that, we kind of just treat them as blocks of numbers that you can visualize in different ways. Uh, yeah, I guess. I think it would be hard to, um, to try and represent data that is fundamentally non-grid-like, because I think the notion of you know, most of these are behind the scenes collections of NumPy arrays. So if you had something that was some kind of like unstructured mesh, I think that'd be much harder. You can imagine writing wrappers that coax it into a mesh. Um, but in general, I think you'd have to work. Um, 
Yeah, um, so the question is, do you have plans for ggtype functionality and you specifically mentioned being able to basically size or color points based on some other quantity. Um, it's something that we had in and then we took out mainly because um, matplotlib gets pretty slow, unfortunately. And so I think what we really need is matplotlib to be able to handle scatter plots as fast as it handles. So basically, matplotlib.scatter needs to be as fast as matplotlib.plot. Um, and then it, once that exists, it'd be trivial to put back in. But right now, it's just matplotlib starts to fall over with 100,000 points. Okay. We're going to have to sure. shut it off there. Thank you very much. Thank you.